there's two things I think work well for me. Loyalty and patience. In 1977, I had a small medical device company in California by the name of IVAC Corporation. Lily was very interested in getting into the medical device business. Mm -hmm. And bottom line was we made a deal with Lily for Lily to buy IVAC. 1977. So, so that means you've been a shareholder for... 47 years. So give us a crash course of your investment philosophy. Is this normal? You hold these things for a long oh, time? Yeah. My average holding is 42 years. 42 years on average. Right, on average. I believe in getting to know management very well. I believe that the key to any great investment are the people at the end of the day. Sure, technology is important, but where does the technology Doesn't come? management change multiple times during well, sure. those periods? and sometimes you have ups and downs. For example, uh, uh, we sold out in 77, and there was a palace revolution at Lilly, and the guy that was had been made CEO for a year got fired, Vaughn Bryson, mm -hmm. and they brought in a fellow who ran a phone company to be the head of the company. Bryson got fired, and the guy that was there that should have gotten the job was Sidney Terrell, who I knew very well. Mm -hmm. And Sidney stayed, thank God, and Sidney finally did get the job. But you held, even though it was the wrong CEO for a while, yeah, because, because you thought I, it'd be fixed. I, I knew how, I, I got to know the company. Well, by the way, when Lilly sold to me, they had a market cap of $2.5 billion, and they had sales of $2 billion. It's pretty low, a pretty low market cap to sales. And they gave us roughly 2.5% of Lilly for our company. There's inflation in the economy, then things were valued really cheaply back yeah, then. Yeah, uh, but also, you know, unless you had a, by the way, a big drug then was $100 million a year. Wow. That was considered to be a successful drug. What's their big drug doing now? Is it GLP-1 stuff they're doing now? Is it the biggest? Well, I think that uh, um, Monjoro, Monjoro probably by 2030, the, the pundits say, probably will be over $30 billion a year, and well over $30 billion. The whole market now is up to 100, those GLP ones. Amazing. You know you know, we're producing a few billion dollars for, for them with one of our companies right now worth this this stuff on the on the wholesale side. We're, we're advanced biomanufacturing. Oh, sure. Well, that's, yeah. there's such great demand. They're in short supply, and that's them and Novo. Lily, I think the profile on the Lily molecule, molecule is far more beneficial than the Novo, but Novo's yeah. got a great product too. So anyway, I got it. I got to know the management. I got to know everybody in the company. I had enormous respect for them. I think they were conservative. They had a great balance sheet. And by the way, they had a nice dividend. Hmm. So I took a company that was, by the way, IVAC, when I took control in 1972 mm -hmm. in a proxy fight, had a market value then of a million and a half dollars. <laughs> Public company. Public company. A million and a half. Public by accident. The guy that was running the company, the guy that I threw out in the proxy fight, would take a packet of stock certificates and one of the devices they made, which is an electronic thermometer, mm -hmm. and go to Las Vegas and go in the back where the band was and take out the thermometer, and he'd sell a guy's stock for a dollar a share, two dollars a share. Crazy. And that was his undoing because effectively, we had to go in and register all those shares. And then you have to go public when you when you well, have to we shareholders. So yeah. for five years, we were public from the time we took control. But we got it cleaned up good. We put a good group of guys in to run it. That's funny. And and it would, so anyway. So if you put a good group of guys in, what, what do you look for in management and leadership? What does that mean to you? First of all, I look for honesty. It'd be the basic stuff. I look for honesty. I look for wisdom in terms of breadth of thinking. Are they thinking provincially or are they thinking globally? Are they thinking about mm -hmm. the opportunities and the possibilities? The thing I loved about Lilly's research was they had a strong franchise in antibiotics back then. Uh, they had a significant animal health business. Ironically, they owned Elizabeth Arden, the cosmetics company, huh. which they eventually sold. But more importantly, they made their mind up they wanted to win the medical devices in a bigger way. So they bought a uh, a cardiac pacemaker company. Uh, 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 they mm -hmm. bought they bought a um, uh, defibrillator company. Mm -hmm. They bought a number of companies related to devices. Most of the devices, of course, were related. So integrity, to expansive thinking, and and also Joe, were they willing to stick their neck out and take chances? Research in R and D, R and D in pharmaceuticals, is a high risk business. 
Mm-hmm. And, and you got to spend a lot of money to be in the game. Lily right now, this year, I think their budget, their R&D budget, is going to be over $10 billion. They're still taking risks. They're still being bold. Well, they're doing it. And included in their research are the cost of clinical trials. Yep. So you can't make a claim unless you go through significant costs. They've spent a lot of money developing these products and applying them to new markets. Yep. And the results look very, the point is, it's always about the people. So my focus always has been, I'm not a scientist. I don't know a molecule from a, uh, whatever the hell else you want to call something scientific, but I know people and I have a pretty good nose. What are you bullish on right now? Are there are there certain teams or certain yeah, areas? Yeah, I'm bullish on a company right now called Option Care Health. At home services, mm-hmm. medical services. So for example, if you're a patient and you need a certain uh, medication intravenously, they have pharmacies all over the United States. They ship the drug to the home for the next day. A nurse shows up the same next day. That's amazing, yeah. And the nurse does the administration there. It seems like keeping things out of the health systems, you save a ton of money. Well, you save money, but also it's safer. Lower infection rate, believe it or not, hospitals are dangerous places. Hospitals kill people by mistake. Well, because the disease is in the hospital. That's what the hospital is there for. So they got a hell of a good management. Uh, They had a weak start, but the guys that came in to run the company have pulled it together, and I'm very excited about that. And I've already owned that stock now almost five years, and we've done okay, but I think we'll do a lot better in the future. Amazing. Can I want to ask you a little bit more about what it takes to be a leader? Your father was a plumber. Your mother was a cafeteria worker. Right. Neither of them went to high school. You started working at age 11 or 12. How did your upbringing shape you and, and help you become a leader? I learned, For example, one of the things I won't take a back say to is judgment of people. I got a pretty good nose for people. That talent or that ability became conscious to me when I was a caddy. And I'd caddy for people. There were two types. There were guys that if they had a bad shot, they didn't blame it on anybody else but themselves. (laughs) And there were guys that if they had a bad shot, they're looking around, who's around that I can blame? (laughs) And typically the guy that gets the punishment is the caddy. The caddy, yeah. But I learned close up, because these guys don't forget, they think we're just mechanical. We, we We don't evaluate, we don't observe, we don't do the things. I made it a point to studying the men I was caddying for and how they behaved and how they treated each other and how they talked to each other and how they treated the caddies. Mm -hmm. To this day, Joe, one of the things I love to do, um, if I'm being asked to evaluate somebody for a job in one of the companies, I like to take them to a meal. And I love to watch how they interact with a waiter or the busboy. How do they talk to them? Yep. What's the tone of their voice? How do they value them as people, you mean? Exactly. Are they, do, do they have empathy? Do they have the ability to make a bridge? I know, I know if you have a waiter that feels good about you, for some mysterious reason, whatever, the service is always better. Yeah. I'll be right back, or I'll bring you this, or I'll bring you, oh, you want this? I'm sorry. It shows awareness of what matters to them, too. Yeah. That's the whole point. That's their life. Yeah. And, and one of the things that really disturbed, I, I was having been in that category myself. You don't feel good when you're beaten up upon by somebody who you can't fight back. Yeah. Because you know, that guy's gonna give you a tip after your caddy. You don't wanna tell him to drop dead because if you do, he says, oh, you told me to drop dead here. Yeah, I'm gonna stiff you. Yeah. Same with waiters. And, and where I get superb service, I like to reward them exceptionally. This reminds me, I know the story of Home Depot is well known, you talk about it a lot, but it reminds me of how you talk about the managers and associates there, right? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I just had a meeting Friday. I took 25 store managers and district managers to lunch. I do it once a year. At Home Depot, I still take them to lunch. And I I have them around in a big circle. We go to a nice restaurant, I let them off the menu, whatever they want. And we go around a room and we talk about what they like and what needs to be fixed and what's wrong. And you got to listen as much to what's wrong as to what's right, because if it's wrong, you got to fix it. But one of the things that comes through loud and clear, again and again, the positive side, the culture, how we take care of each other, how we care about our associates. I'll make a bet that of those 25 remarks from each one of them, I'll bet 75% of them focus on the culture. And that was something we developed day one. That was something we said, 
We're going to be mindful that the most important person in the company are the people on the floor of the stores because they're the ones that interact with the customer. That's they're amazing. the ones where if they give the customer a great experience, the customer's going to remember. The waiter, 